today, me and my colleague Benjamin are going to be talking about um, are going to be talking about the capability of inverter technologies to meet the future needs of system black start and system restoration. Let me dive right into the topic. Sorry about that. So before we talk about a little bit more about uh, the IBR's role in restoration, let's go back to the basic. Restoration basically is a very complex process that needs to be meticulously planned and executed to, to limit the social and economic consequences. And nowadays with increased threat of extreme weather and foreign attacks, it's become even more important to ensure that we have robust restoration plans in place. And concurrently, the grid is going through unprecedented transition, especially with increased proliferation of power electronic devices into the system, both at the generator level and at the load level. Therefore, some of our traditional um, practices that we've been following in restoration needs to be um, needs to be revisited. Like I said, one of the chief challenges has been the changing generation mix with retirement of more and more conventional plants that were the backbone in many of the restoration procedures. Now the question of what uh, generation or what plants will replace these conventional plants need to, be, uh, need to be addressed. And apart from that, with increased penetration of inverter-based resources, looking at how to maximize the utilization of these inverter-based resources, not just in the normal day-to-day -day operations, but also looking at these restoration in order to utilize all their uh, important features has become uh, important. And apart from this, our reliance on power system infrastructure is growing more and more every single day with electrification of transportation and conversion of a lot of heating sources now into electricity, it's become more and more important to ensure that in case of blackouts, the power systems can be res uh, restored very quickly. Now, um, and as always, ensuring that we have utilized all the available resources completely and ensured that the total restoration time has been reduced is always on top of our, our, all our mind. Now, why IBRs? IBRs can be used in different forms in restoration. IBRs can be used to re-energize the transmission network, thus providing a cranking path to other generators. They can be used for a demand supply if there are some critical loads like hospitals and other public uh, utilities, as well as uh, supply power to critical loads such as power plants and nuclear power sites. If um, these uh, black star capabilities are not present, IBRs can also bolster in ensuring that we can have better frequency and voltage control during uh, restoration. It can support island development efforts. And also, in some cases, they can increase the amount of available uh, fault current contribution in the system. Now I call upon Benjamin to talk about some of the key system analysis that needs to be done in order to consider IBRs. Hi, Lakshmi. Thank you. Yeah, first of all, um, let me bring to you uh, some key considerations. Uh, let's, let's explore some key considerations when integrating IBRs with uh, grid forming technology. So first of all, uh, the power regulation. So we need to keep in mind that the IBR system will need to fulfill the power requirements on the power frequency and voltage reactive power regulation. And we need to keep in mind that the IBRs will be the primary, will be the primary system regulation. So we need to ask ourselves if the IBRs are going to have enough, enough power to, to provide this regulation. A second aspect could be the energization path. In this case, uh, are the IBRs capable of continuing with previous energization paths, which might be designed for probably conventional units such, such as uh, thermal units or gas turbines, considering that, that loads and generation are also going to be connected? Or is there any potential for improvement here? 
uh, which will be a dedicated energization path for an IVR system with grid forming technology. Also, we need to pay attention into any inter area inter interactions. Uh, how should the interactions of these IBRs uh, will be uh, if there is any other unit, other any other generation unit in the system? And we know we also need to pay attention on any other unit that will play a significant role uh, that might ensure a successful restoration, a successful black star restoration. Also, it is impo important to pay attention on the controls, any control system improvements that we may have or require. Uh, for instance, what other layer of control should be taken into consideration if using grid forming technology. And last but not least, protection adequacy. And with this, we need to, we need to be sure, uh, we need to know that the current protection scheme has been designed with a different unit uh, if, the, if, the energy, if the energization path is already existing. So we need to be sure that there will be a correct activation of the protection system. Or in the country, will it be necessary to recalibrate this protection system? So these are uh, some of the questions that our system analysis tries to, tries to focus with the, with the aim of gaining a better, a comprehensive, comprehensive understanding on the capabilities and, and some limitations that uh, the integration of IVRs with grid forming may have. So uh, with this, I hand, hand over back to you, uh, Lakshmi. Thank you, Benjamin. Now, uh, moving forward, now that uh, Benjamin has given us a brief introduction of what kind of system uh, analysis considerations needs to be uh, done, let's talk about uh, the methodology and some of the, uh, on a general scale, what are the different assessments that needs to be done and what different analysis needs to be done. Now, currently, one of the ways of thinking has been mostly to see if IBRs can replace the conventional black start units. However, this is one way of thinking where we are trying to kind of force IBRs to behave like conventional sources. However, they have their own uh, characteristics and they have quite a few advantages over um, conventional resources. They have flexible, they have far more flexible operations and um, they can adapt their response and their controls is pretty fast. However, there are definitely challenges. There can be adverse control interactions. Uh, there can, if we are considering PV or when their variable feedstock availability. And finally, one of the most important parts is limited for uh, current injection. Therefore, um, it introduces new challenges because we need to balance these advantages and challenges that are involved in IBRs. Rather than just thinking how IBR can fit into our current paradigm or conventional restoration sources, we also need to start thinking of how, if there is any need to adapt the way that we are currently developing our restoration plans in order to complement the capability and fully utilize all the characteristics of IBRs. Therefore, in order to do so, we have currently split it down into different stages of this methodology. One would be the steady state analysis, which is your power flow analysis. This will help in determination of optimal restoration paths in order to reach those critical units, uh, critical loads, and other non black start units. Uh, estimation of the rating of IVRs, especially if this is a battery storage where you're looking at analyzing what's the total capacity of battery that will be required, especially if this is a new IBR that's being introduced. And in cases of extreme weather, where certain uh, transmission uh, corridors might be uh, unavailable and other resources might not be available due to weather or just lack of personnel and other issues, development of alternate uh, strategies will help improve the resiliency. So all of this can be done in a steady state analysis where you go through the process of looking at it in the power flow. But this won't be enough because looking at dynamics is also important, especially looking at their frequency and inertia response with addition of every new stage, looking at importance of how the fault analysis might happen. And in case of faults, if uh, the protection is adequate, 
uh, that is something that can be done using positive sequence simulation. However, now with IPRs, with faster controls and limited resources, it now becomes even more important to start looking at electromagnetic uh, simulations to look at if there are control interactions between different IBRs in the system or between IBR and other conventional sources that might be present, the impact of especially transformer and uh, large EHV energization studies and looking at how that might impact and finally, looking at power quality and if that will impact the operation of IBRs. And these are all still in the simulation realm. Definitely, live testing will uh, help uncover more limitations that um, can be looked at using simulation. Now, at EPRI, uh, we've basically developed a few tools to help in uh, better development of these uh, restoration uh, plants. And one of the most commonly used approach in restoration is the bottom-up approach. In this approach, one or more black star generators are used to first energize the transmission backbone that form the cranking paths to uh, non-black star generators and critical loads. Um, next, the islands of energized uh, Lakshmi, network facility. Hi, Lakshmi. Yeah? I think we cannot see your screen so, for some reason. Yeah. Suddenly disconnected your screen. Oh, I'm sorry about that. Oh, no problem. Thank you for that. Is this visible? Uh, it's, it's it's downloading now. Let's wait for some time. No, I cannot see the screen. That's strange. Interesting. Um, Lakshmi, you want to? I can yeah. try to share my screen. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Benjamin. Okay. Sure. Just one second. Let me know if you can all see my screen now. Yeah, I can see your screen, yeah. That's great. Okay. Uh... Thank you so much, Benjamin. I'm sorry, I apologize for the interference. So at every, um, okay, in the bottom-up approach, as I was saying, and eventually once these cranking paths and uh, small uh, islands are formed, then uh, in order to, they are synchronized and then it's built up. And ensuring at every stage of this process, understanding the prevailing power system conditions and studying the impact of energizing the next facility becomes important because at every step, uh, if uh, it fails, then everything has to start right from the beginning. And therefore, these uh, restoration studies are complex and time consuming. So at EPRI, we have developed two different uh, restoration support tools that we have used for our, uh, our, our studies regularly. One is called as the System Restoration Navigator, or SRN. This is a decision support tool for operators and planners to uh, develop, evaluate, and revise their existing uh, system restoration plans. And whereas the other tool, which is called as the Optimal Black Start Capability Tool, is uh, to identify the optimal Black Start locations. And it also uh, looks for effectiveness of the existing and new black structs. So one is more of a point-to-point, step-by-step simulation of the existing restoration path, whereas the other tool will basically uh, you, it'll assess the effectiveness of a black strut resource and also help you get the most optimal uh, solution. Uh, next slide, please. Now, uh, a little bit more detail of uh, system restoration uh, tool. Like I was saying, it's, a it's used to develop and execute the restoration plan. It is also can be used to verify your existing restoration plan and look at what if different conditions change, how that will impact. Just having one restoration plan might not work in case of certain um, extreme weather conditions. So this will definitely help improve the restoration strategies especially for cases where 
some of the low frequency event where multiple transmission lines or multiple facilities are unavailable, how that can help us. So this is a tool that can be used. This is a steady state tool. And uh, so uh, the dynamic portion of this is currently not included in this analysis. Next slide, please. The optimal Black Star capability, OBC software tool, is uh, designed to be used by the transmission and planning and operations engineer to assess the Black Star capability of the system that they already have. Uh, like I was saying, this tool can be used to identify optimal locations for new Black Star capability to, and to facilitate the system restoration effect. And this can also be used to provide the optimal restoration and energization path from the Black Star units to other non-Black Star units and critical loads. It will help decide, it will help show you what's the quickest path to reach the different uh, critical loads that uh, we already have. So with the help of these two different uh, tools, you'll be able to assess not only what you currently have and look at what is the estimated time of restoration, but you'll also be able to look at what happens under different contingencies and how you might optimize it further. Uh, next slide, please. So um, this was a quick introduction into our uh, one, the IBRs, how the introduction of what, how IBRs can play an important role in restoration and looking at some of the tools that we currently have in EPRI. Now we'll go through two different case studies that we have done at EPRI, looking at uh, especially IBRs and how it can provide um, black star services to a system. Next slide, please. So this is one of the um, a cranking paths that we have studied in the utilities network. The primary goal of this Black Start study was utilization of a combination of IBRs that were present or that were going to be present in the system as shown in the left-hand side to energize a 500 kV line in order to reach a generating station and energize some of the loads mainly three-phase induction motors that are present in the generating station, and look at how uh, if that can be done successfully using uh, the best. And three different IBRs were uh, utilized in this case study. One is a battery storage and two different PV units. Both of these were assumed to have grid forming and grid following capabilities. Now, Considering this is a 500 kV line that was the main part of this cranking path, two different transformers were present, and these were large transformers whose uh, MVA rating was in the range of 400 to 1,100 MVA. The transmission line itself was a 60-mile transmission line, and the far end was a generating station, like I said. And um, most of the loads in that were three-phase induction motor loads, and these were for pumps and other uh, auxiliary load that need to be started in order to start up the generating station. So the key goal of this was to look at one, um, this was the methodology that, it's okay, Benjamin, next slide, please. This was the methodology that we used and the different objectives. One was in order to ensure that we are able to study the system in detail, we did a detailed data collection of different components of the cranking path, so ensuring that we have uh, details about the transmission line, about the transformers, and different parts of the uh, cranking path is important, and ensuring more and more um, reasonable and accurate models will definitely help develop a more confidence in the restoration path. Apart from this, we also developed um, with the help, this was a collaborative effort with Enrel, we developed a grid forming model, and using this model, we were able to black start the entire process. And we used more detailed uh, model at every possible stage. We used the frequency dependent line model for transmission line. We ensured that the saturation parameters of transformers were included. Even though they were not provided based on our uh, previous experience, we made an assumption regarding these parameters. And finally, uh, we looked at the EMT simulation of these uh, energization paths in step-by-step. We looked at the load pickup 
And most importantly, we looked at the impact of soft energization to restore the crank impact. Uh, next slide, please. So soft energization. This has been one of the more um, ongoing uh, discussions in the, in the realm of IBR restoration. It's the process of energizing a part of the network at lower level and gradually increasing the voltage to normal levels before picking up the load. And this case study was um, ideal to do this simulation because the load was on the far side of the 500 kV transformers and there were two different large transformers. And so the inrush currents would definitely be lower in this case. And also it would be a good example to study the impact of slowly increasing the voltage after energizing a portion and seeing if there could be any adverse uh, interactions or if there could be seen any oscillations. And um, so this definitely is a good process in certain situations where the load is not being picked up constantly. However, um, this is still a very new uh, aspect the fault detection is definitely becomes more complicated when in the initial portions when the voltage is not being raised to one per unit. Apart from that, it needs to be, it has not been yet fully validated in practical field tests and need more testing. Apart from that, um, we have not completely understood the impacts of soft energization on the magnetic characteristics and looking at how having different ramp rates might uh, affect the process is still something that needs to be studied. Next slide, please. So this is in short the energization that was done, where in the first case study, we assumed that we have complete uh, capability of all the three uh, IBR generators. So the total capacity is present. And so they were energized between two to five seconds. You can see the voltage at the point of common coupling in the top left and the frequency in the bottom left. And the active and reactive power are also shown in this figure. In this case, uh, till about um, 18 seconds, the voltage is kept at 30%. And then uh, the voltage is slowly increased to one per unit. And then the motors are um, energized sequentially from 30 to uh, 45 seconds. So this is just a quick view of the entire simulation. We didn't see any instability with respect to voltage or frequency. We could energize all the auxiliary load. Even though there was a certain amount of inrush, there were no major impacts of that. And uh, we saw that with soft energization, the impact of inrush was definitely reduced. Um, next slide, please. So this is just a few more details about the auxiliary load that was uh, that we have modeled in non-black start units. We had modeled six individual pumps and compressors using the three-phase induction model. Most of these models are categorized as NEMA type B, and they were uh, parameterized based on the torque slip characteristics they were shown and verified using um, separate uh, simulation. And on the right, you can actually see the zoomed in version of uh, the simulation between 30 to uh, 45 seconds. Individual rise that you're seeing is each of the six motors energizing. So what you observe the curve going up is actually the reactive and uh, power increasing, which happens during inrush. And the inrush current can be as much as six to eight times, depending on the motors, which is what we were seeing. We did see some small oscillations, but these were also present in the uh, in the model itself when tested in by in isolation. So we did see that the voltage at the uh, load end also dropped with each uh, in rush, but we saw that it recovered back quickly as soon as the motor started. Uh, next slide, please. So apart from just looking at what happens with one case study, the most obvious question is the fact that what if there is limited uh, IBR resources, especially if PV is not available, then that is one of the questions that we had. So we tested different scenarios in uh, these cases. The base case is when we assume that all the three resources are available and they're in grid forming mode. 
And now we assume that only one of the PV is available. And this is a way of saying that the PV uh, resource is limited. And finally, we only use the best to uh, start the entire process. And finally, we assume that the PV did not have grid forming capability and the best did. So the best was used as a black start resource and PV in the grid following mode. Uh, next slide, please. This is just a comparison of each of those uh, cases. Now here, I would like to say that with soft energization, we saw that uh, with uh, 400 MVA capacity was sufficient to en energize the generator auxiliary load. And the terminal voltage remained above 0.9 for all these cases. And most importantly, there were no adverse control uh, interactions that we had observed, and the motors could be uh, successfully energized. Uh, definitely, with different amount of resources available, you can see that the frequency, uh, the frequency of the system will change, especially in cases where only best is available. You can start seeing that the frequency uh, keeps on reducing, but this can still be adjusted with the use of troop and changing the value of troop. Uh, this uh, was an initial study that was conducted in order to see if uh, BESS could be used, if the IBRs could be used to energize a 500 kV line and the generator auxiliary load on the other side of the things. This, was, uh, this is kind of unique because usually during early restoration, the energization of high, extra high voltage lines is avoided mainly because of their reactive power, uh, the amount of reactive power that needs to be absorbed. But that is exactly the advantage of IBR, that practically IBRs can behave as statcoms or SVCs where they can absorb immense amount of uh, reactive power without having any kind of minimum level of active power output. So this is one of the features that we could uh, leverage that um, might modify some of the uh, traditional restoration procedures that uh, we think follow. Uh, I'll stop right here and pass on the baton to uh, Benjamin to talk about the other utility study. Thank you. Thank you, Lakshmi. Um, well, let me introduce you to the second utility case study. Uh, quickly, let me show you a system description. So this study was, was uh, done in close collaboration with, with one utility uh, member of EPRI, uh, where we are helping them to understand what are the best opportunities for IBRs, in this case, uh, battery energy system, to, uh, this, uh, to replace conventional units, in this case, a gas turbine, uh, which was, which was uh, performing the block start restoration of an Icelandic part of the grid uh, in order to reach the, the carbon emission goals for a, future, uh, for, the, for a future planning. In this case, we can see a, a, sh a short description of the, of the portion of the grid that is going to be restored. We can observe that the battery is, got, is, is connecting on the lower side of a 33 kb uh, transformer. And then there is a 50, 50 kilometer line that is going to connect to a synchronous condenser, which is part of the, of the grid. The synchronous condenser has the particularity that it's, it's going to be energized by, utilize, utilize, by the utilization of a, a soft frequency converter. Uh, and next, the final goal of, of the energization is to reach either one of the two goals, uh, which can be a synchronous generator, uh, at, which is a thermal unit in this case, or to reach uh, an HPDC connection link that uh, connects this islanded grid to the, to the mainland or to the, in this case, represented by an external grid. So for the first, uh, for, the, for the grid forming model, we have used the, the grid forming model de developed by EPRI, which is a generic model. In this case, uh, the generic model has the possibility of being parametrized in such a way that we can use two types of grid forming modes or grid forming flavors. This can be uh, droop-based uh, grid forming modes 
or a virtual synchronous machine. In, in either case, we are able to, do, to use uh, Drupe controllers. And in the case of virtual synchronous machine, we can also include uh, inertia response into the controllers. Additionally, in this, in this picture, we can observe, uh, I don't want to go too much into details, but we can observe part of the current controllers in the upper side of, of the block diagram. In the middle side, we can see how the controllers will synchronize with the grid, either with TrueBase or BSM. And finally, how the controllers are integrated into the system to provide uh, signals for the, for the source, in this case, the, the, the best model connected to the network. So for the first energization path, which is uh, the thermal unit, We've been able to we've been able to uh, observe that lines, auto transformers, and load pickups have been successfully uh, goals have been successfully met. In in either case, voltage always remain around uh, nominal values. Also, frequency was able to was able to re to to be restored to nominal values. In this case, with the aid of a secondary frequency controller which was proposed by the utility member. And also have evidence that the best can provide sufficient power to regulate both power and frequency. Also, we've been able to observe that uh, connecting the synchronous condensers through this, to the static frequency converter didn't pose uh, any adverse operating conditions for the, for the grid forming battery. So we didn't observe any adverse in control interactions and the synchronous condenser was successfully energized with the, with the battery and resource. Also, uh, we, we were able to effectively connect the thermal unit and, the, the, and synchronize the synchronous generator unit to the, to the grid with the aid of the battery system. In this case, the, the grid forming controllers were able to support operation of parallel, to support parallel operation uh, with the generator. On the second goal of the energization of the on energization path, we wanted to connect the the grid, which was already energized in green, to the HBDC link, and also to pick up some other essential loads and ballast loads, which are uh, important to meet the minimum requirements, the, the minimum power requirements of the HBDC link. So in this case, it is interesting to see uh, the sequence of operations uh, for which the HBDC uh, comes into line. So first of all, at, at 10 seconds, the, the LCC is deblocked and the HBDC link starts generating power and you can observe in the lower in the lower figure how the HPDC starts to produce, starts producing up to 50 megawatts, which is the minimum power operation, the minimum threshold operation for the LCC. Uh, after a few operations on the BES and on the HPDC, we can observe after 15 seconds how the battery is behaving like load in order to provide uh, in order to provide regulation. For the frequency, in, in, this, in this case, supporting stable operation. So later, at 35, uh, 50, and 60 seconds, additional loads are, are being picked up by the battery, in this case. And we can observe that the battery goes from behaving as a load and back to generation mode. Later, at 65 seconds, an additional power set point sent to the LCC uh, connection in order to increase generation to 80 megawatts. And again, we can, we can observe that the battery was able to reduce uh, generation in order to keep, uh, in order to maintain frequency within, within normal limits. We, can, we were able to observe that voltage and frequency uh, were always kept within acceptable uh, values during the during the whole energization process. 
also uh, it's important to not to it's important to not that the reactive power was being provided by the synchronous condenser in this case and the best was acting as the only active power regulation uh, unit in the in the system an additional study that we have uh, carried on in uh, in this in this study case was the use of a, a statistical approach in which we try to close the circuit breaker of the different uh, transformers present in the system at a different at a, at a different closing angles with the aim of uh, pinpointing the most critical scenarios uh, the most critical scenarios for the protection system and for the insulation limits so we can observe on the left figure uh, all the points in the in the in the plots represent different uh, different EMT simulations, and in in this case, if we take for example one of them, we we can observe the EMT, the instantaneous voltage response, but also the RMS response in the system. So this is important in order to verify that the instantaneous voltage that does not exceed the insulation limits according to the IEC, IEC standards, and also for the RMS voltage, that no generation protection relay uh, will trip during the energization procedure. So finally, uh, I'd like, like to give you some key takeaways uh, on the two uh, and the two study, case, study cases that we have uh, presented here. So for power regulation, uh, we have a scene that provided that the IVR has sufficient rating uh, and that the controller is tuned properly, it can be used effectively for restoration. Uh, for inter oscillations, again, if tuned properly, diver, the IVRs uh, are capable of synchronizing with different units, such as synchronous generators, HBDC links, and any other grid following unit. Additionally, we have tested any different types of, uh, we, ha we have tested that the IVRs can provide the stability to energize other types of units such as static frequency con uh, converters. For the control system improvements, uh, we have tested that additional, additional layers like secondary frequency controllers could be used during, this, during the Black Star restoration. Uh, and, the, and this is to ensure that the frequency, the frequency swings will not trip the protection. The process of soft, energi of soft energization can also be used to mitigate the impact of line changing, charging, and transformer inrush. On the protection adequacy, uh, we have seen that insufficient, the, the insufficient fault cap capability of the IVRs during, during energization will remain a concern. But in one of the study cases, we have witnessed that additional support with synchronous condensers will help, will help to mitigate this. Anyway, uh, the adequacy of the, network, of the network protection will still need to be assessed during critical steps while the synchronous condenser is not still online. And finally, for the energization path, uh, depending on the energization path, the power system components, parameters, and also the system characteristics, uh, the IVRs could be potentially a replacement for the, for the conventional units. But also, uh, it, it could be possible to, pro to design dedicated energization paths that could address IVR limitations to improve, uh, to improve the Black Star success. So uh, thank you very much for your attention. And now if you have any questions, we will be uh, open to answer them. Okay, so thank you so much, Lagda. Uh...